Okay, I want to welcome everybody to Pediatric Grand Rounds. I'm delighted that we have with us today Dr. David Kessler. Dr. Kessler serves as Chief Science Officer for the U.S. COVID response for President Joe Biden and has led a co-led Operation Warp Speed and the Countermeasures Acceleration Group. He's responsible for the White House and Health and Human Services efforts on vaccine and therapeutics. Dr. Kessler was commissioner of the FDA from 1990 to 1997 under both presidents George H.W. Bush and Bill Clinton. As commissioner of the FDA, he acted to speed approval of new drugs and placed high priority on getting promising therapies for serious and life-threatening diseases to patients as quickly as possible, including the accelerated approval for major drugs in the treatment of HIV AIDS, culminating in the development of protease inhibitors. Under his direction, the FDA announced a number of new programs, including the regulation of the marketing and sale of tobacco products to children, nutritional labeling for food, and the MedWatch program for reporting adverse events and product problems. Dr. Kessler has served as chair of the board of the Center for Science in the Public Interest and the Elizabeth Glazer Pediatric AIDS Foundation. In the latter role, he helped spearhead a major global effort to make drugs available to millions to end the transmission of mother to child HIV AIDS. Dr. Kessler is professor on leave of pediatrics here in our department at UCSF, as well as in epidemiology and biostatistics. He served previously as Dean of the medical school here at UCSF, as well as Dean at Yale. He's a graduate of Amherst College and the University of Chicago Law School, as well as Harvard Medical School. He's had numerous awards, including the Public Welfare Medal from the National Academy of Sciences. Dr. Kessler is a member of the National Academy of Medicine and is the author of a number of books addressing pressing public health issues of our time. So it's both an honor and a pleasure, Dr. Kessler, to welcome you here today to our Pediatric Grand Rounds at UCSF to talk about the latest uh, in terms of the COVID pandemic. And I'd like to start with just getting your reflections Looking back at the last couple of years, this has been a really historic achievement um, in, in our um, biomedical world. First of all, just to have a vaccine ready to go within a year of the start of this pandemic is truly historic. Wouldn't have been possible with the state of the art that existed even a few years ago. And second, the monumental effort to, to deliver 700 million doses of vaccine in this country. So maybe we could begin by just getting your reflections on what were the lessons that have been learned, what worked well, and what could have been done better. Thanks for, you know, thanks for having me back home. Uh, I appreciate it uh, very much, if, if only uh, uh, for, you know, an hour. Um, if anyone knows anything about government, it's sort of the, the reflection is, how hard it is to get anything done in government. It's just, it's complicated, right? I mean, there's a reason why, um, you know, there's that term bureaucracy. So when you think about it, Dr. Hirsch, when you use that fact that we've delivered to date 740 million uh, vaccines that some 580 million have gone into arms um, and we've done that uh, safely, um, it's it's really a you know I think as you say it, it's just been an enormous uh, privilege, um, and I think that uh, you know we have I mean it's been a very historic period I think I mean certainly in, in my experience I've been in government uh, before uh, we have um, you know we, we saw this problem clearly I've had. The opportunity to work with the best and the, and the brightest. Um, the philosophy from the beginning is to, this is uh, you know once in a century kind of problem. Um, this is, I mean, a nice part of this. This is actually this is a, a president who I knew before he became president. Uh, you know, and and we had developed that relationship, um, and 
we understood this was a problem that we we just needed to overwhelm um, uh, in with solution. Um, and there were many times where we understood we were breaking glass, um, but we did it. Um, the vaccines, you know, anyone who wanted access, no matter where you were in the United States, uh, it took a little while. I mean, I think we we got there. Uh, we got there not only in the first primary rounds, we got there on boosts. We, um, you know, two two times, um, we got antivirals. We delivered, you know, as historic I think as the vaccines, you know, driving the Pfizer drug uh, and getting that out uh, in an antiviral that has an eighty nine percent efficacy. Uh, in that time, you know, I had the privilege of working back on HIV. So I think that is also, you know, a major, uh, you know, historic, you know, all my colleagues, uh, you know, my hat is off to them. You know, but I think that I think there are two re big remaining issues, um, you know, that, that just need to get done. And I think we're going to talk about one. Uh, you know, I think uh, the most pressing issue for me is uh, vaccines for kids under five. Um, that still is, the, to me, the great remaining issue. Uh, and then I think we, and we will, you know, that will, issue will be addressed and hopefully come to resolution. Um, uh, and we'll talk about it today. I mean, uh, over the next, you know, I mean, through by the end of June. And I think also by, by June, we have to come together and really decide and look at the science um, on how to improve on the vaccine and see if we can come up with a more durable um, vaccine um, for the fall where people can be boosted on. You know, we, de we develop these vaccines uh, against the prototype and the ancestral strain. Uh, there's been considerable antigenic drift uh, since then. Um, and I think uh, the science that we've been undertaking um, uh, shows, I think we can, uh, we can tweak this vaccine um, and hopefully come up with uh, a vaccine um, that improves durability, but retains its the efficacy um, against hospitalizations and severe disease. Thank you, and uh, I do want to I do want to ask a few questions about kids. Uh, I just want to remind the audience uh, that we the grand rounds today. It's a webinar format, uh, so I do encourage you to ask questions. If you have questions, use the Q and A link at the bottom rather than the chat link. And um, I'm gonna leave some time at the end. Uh, I've got a, a few questions I wanna ask Dr. Kessler and then I wanna leave time for the audience questions as well. So please feel free to start to put your questions in the Q and A. Um, so Dr. Kessler, you, you mentioned kids and that's obviously at the front uh, of the minds of many of the people uh, listening to this grand rounds today. Uh, I want to ask you about the approval for, for vaccines for children under the age of five. First of all, um, we still don't have an approved vaccine for this age group, although Moderna this week has submitted its request for emergency use authorization. And this has left pediatricians as well as parents frustrated uh, as to how long it's taken for this age group to be approved. What has held up the approval? And when do you think we might see vaccine approved for this age group? So um, I think that FDA has scheduled three dates, um, June 8th, June 21st, June 22nd. Uh, and I would hope uh, by the, uh, in the month of June that um, uh, there would be an authorized vaccine. I don't wanna get out ahead of FDA. FDA is part of the decision-making process. As you said, Moderna just finally submitted their application was complete yesterday. Um, and I, what I'd like to do is show you the, the data that will be presented. Moderna has given me permission to show you that data. Some of this is, uh, has been part of uh, Moderna's uh, press release, but I, the format I will show you, they've given me permission. Um, and we also, I expect data to come in uh, from Pfizer uh, uh, later this month or early uh, in June. Um, and I expect that also will go to FDA. Now, FDA will look at this decision with regard to safety and efficacy, uh, but understand after that, our CDC's uh, ACIP, the Committee, uh, um, Committee on Immunization Practice, will also 
uh, review those. So both have to take place uh, uh, in uh, June. Uh, and I, I hope we're finally uh, getting down uh, to the stretch. And uh, by the end of it, we will have vaccine ready. We are, uh, we, we are ready to ship out vaccine um, and get them to pediatricians' offices, offices and uh, community health centers and clinics and, uh, and pharmacies as soon as there's that authorization. But I think people need to understand, especially pediatricians, um, maybe the answer, why is it taking so long? You know, if I can take you through that process and a little of the data, um, I think people can then understand um, and think through, you know, some of the complexity associated with this. Do you want to share that now? But let, let, let me just start off by explaining the process a little. Okay. Okay. Um, the pivotal studies for both Moderna and Pfizer, both mRNA done in adults, uh, were done uh, down, you know, down to 18. They show those pivotal studies, it's tens of thousands of people, adults, they demonstrated clinical efficacy. Remember that was done against the ancestral strain. And that's where that 94%, both asymptomatic uh, protection, as well as protection against serious disease and the 90% come from. So that, uh, that demonstration of efficacy was done in adults. Now, the way companies develop a vaccine uh, in children is you have to dose de-escalate by age groups. Now, you'll remember there was the issue in the adolescence, the myocarditis issue um, that added complexity, um, but that seems to be primarily associated um, you know, with that age group from about 16 to 25, certainly uh, under 40, but that slowed down the process, no doubt, and needed to be sorted out. But when a company, you know, undertakes the study of vaccine done in adults, did you have safety and efficacy in adults, you have to basically do a dose de-escalation study and you have to arrive at the right dose, right? And, and when you look at that, in that what the phase one study is, is you wanna see what the immunogenicity is, but you also wanna see what the reactogenicity is, right? How much fever, I mean, are there complications? but also how immunogenic and what the antibody titers are. Here's the rules, okay? I mean, that FDA set out, what a company has to show, right? So the, the company basically doesn't have to go out and redo the whole clinical efficacy and show that it prevents hospitalizations because that takes tens and tens of thousands of, of people. But the, what the FDA said is companies need to be able to study a vaccine, to dose de-escalate, find a safe dose, an acceptable level of fever and reactogenicity. And it has to match the neutralizing antibodies from that dose that's selected has to be equivalent to the neutralizing antibodies, the geometric mean titer of the 16 to 25 year old group. That was the rule that was set out. If you show that you can be safe, your reactogenicity, no adverse, significant adverse event, events, you don't have to show uh, a clinical endpoint. You have to show that you match the neutralizing antibodies uh, that, that's equivalent because that was basically, a, it's called immunobridging, right? So Pfizer did that, you'll remember in, in February and came out did studied a two dose of vaccine and again two age groups the pfizer dose that was selected remember the adult dose is you know 30 micrograms and pfizer selected it on phase one three micrograms so that's a tenth of the adult dose and what pfizer announced in february was yes safe no no significant reactogenicity but it missed it didn't achieve that level of neutralizing antibodies in the two to five. It did match in the uh, six months to two, the neutralizing antibodies. That was equivalent. So, you know, but it was in essence, um, uh, I think the, the, the ratio that Pfizer said, it, it was about uh, 0.6. So it was, it was less if you looked at that geometric mean titer, and Pfizer then said, okay, we're not gonna submit, we're gonna go study a third dose. 
right? Now, it's a fair question. Should you, you know, one could argue, well, why don't you get started with that first dose? Pfizer did not submit an application, still has not, you know, I mean, asked FDA, I mean, there's rolling data going in. But Pfizer studied two doses. It didn't hit, it was not, uh, it didn't meet that immunobridging criteria. Moderna goes with two doses. It was behind uh, Pfizer. Right. Um, and um, let me show you the data that it has just submitted. Um, it's been complete as of yesterday. Sharice, can you just put up the slides? Again, this is with permission of Moderna. The next slide, please. So let, let me just explain what you're seeing here. The, the study that was done in the kids under five, again, there were two groups. There was a uh, segregated uh, between six months uh, and 23 months, and then two years to five, right? So there were, that was called study P204. P301, I said, remember I said it has to be a comparison to 18 to 25 year olds, right? And the Moderna dose, I said Pfizer, interestingly, was going with a pediatric dose of three micrograms versus an adult of 30. Here, what Moderna has selected was a, a dose for kids under five at 25 micrograms. Remember that the primary dose for Moderna is 100. The booster dose is 50. So Pfizer selected a dose that was a tenth of the adult dose. Here, Moderna's selecting a dose that's a quarter, right? So obviously, you know, uh, an increased dose compared to the adult dose. So what did they do and what did the data come back and what is gonna go to that advisory committee in the early part of June um, that Moderna is going to present? Before these kids get immunized, right? They, they draw blood, they get the baseline geometric mean titer. This is the pseudo neutralization assays. And you see in both age groups, you know, there was about the, the, the baseline before immunization, you see those numbers about seven, and you see the, the, the baseline for the adolescent, the 18 to 25 year olds. You give the vaccine, you give two doses of Moderna here. And what you see is that in the kids six months to 23 months, the geometric mean titer for those kids was 1781. And the geometric mean titer for the kids two to five was 1410. And now remember, it has to be equivalent to, it has to be in the range of the geometric mean titer of that 18 to 25, that's the immunobridging. And that geometric mean titer of those, you know, 18 to 25 was 1391. So the next, you know, row, you see the ratio of the GMT in these kids to the GMT in the 18 to 25. And you see that the ratio was 1781 over 1391 gives you a ratio of 1.28. This met the immunobridging. In fact, it surpassed the immunobridging and you see the confidence interval. And um, in the two to five-year-old, it met it exactly, 1.01. .01. And both are acceptable from FDA. And then you look and make sure that the, you, know, the, the, uh, you, you see um, virtually every kid um, zero uh, converted and there wasn't a difference in the incident of zero uh, conversion. So from the immunobridging, did it meet the immunobridging criteria? Moderna, yes. Let's go to the next slide. Now, Moderna, you should know, is submitting, even though we have already you know, authorized and have shipped out adolescent doses uh, and doses uh, for kids 6 to 11, Moderna is actually submitting uh, all their, their uh, uh, childhood vaccines of course, again, Moderna was held up because of that adolescent issue of myocarditis. Let me leave that aside. We do not see any evidence of myocarditis in any of these um, uh, data that I'm presenting today. Let's go to the next slide. Now, in addition to do immunobridging, 
because you have, in essence, about you know, several thousand kids in this study, right? You have kids who did not get, uh, who got placebo and kids who got the mRNA. And, and you have these two subsets, six to 23 months and two to five years. Now, this was not a clinical efficacy study. This was an immunobridging study. But what FDA asks is the company to also to count the number of cases of positive cases for symptomatic disease. The endpoint is symptomatic disease, not hospitalization, not just PCR, but symptomatic disease plus PCR positive, one symptom plus PCR, and just give us what the case counts were. Now, this is not powered into the tens of thousands, but it gives you some sense. It can, I mean, it can give you a vaccine efficacy number. And remember that the original vaccines, and here's the rub, the original vaccines, you know, for adults and adolescents, that the, the were, the were tested, were tested in a world against ancestral um, uh, vaccine. People were going to the hospital. Omicron is a whole different, you know, uh, set of considerations. And, but what came back, right, in addition to the fact that, it, that Moderna met the immunobridging criteria, if you look and you have to understand that, you know, uh, there was 513 in the placebo arm and 15, 11, so it's a three to one randomization. But when you, when you look at the number of the incidence rate per 1,000 person years, you see that the vaccine efficacy, unlike, I mean, in these, from Moderna, right, was 50% in the six to 23 month old group and two to five in the, I'm sorry, 36.8% in the two to five year old. Certainly not the um, 90% that we were expected against hospitalization. Now this again, isn't measuring against hospitalization. This is measuring against symptomatic disease. And if you go, Sharice, just to the next slide, if you look at what, what vaccine efficacy is in adults, against Omicron, the numbers are very different. So when you look at something and you look at 50% and 36% and you do a, you know, a combined of about 40% vaccine efficacy against symptomatic disease, you go, well, that's not very good. But again, that's not hospitalizations. What's key here is if you look at adults and you, and again, you measure, and you, you're really measuring in the kids 14 to, 19, 14 to 90 days, and you look at the Omicron graph, I mean, I mean, it, it, the, I mean the, the original vaccines, if it had been tested in Omicron, you look at that efficacy in an Omicron world against adults is only 44%. So I mean, we would have never approved or been able to say that our existing vaccines had 90% because against Omicron, the adult vaccines are only give you a vaccine efficacy of 44%. So there's no difference here. Now, you go, well, 44% is not very good. I mean, it's not great, it's not 90%, but again, this is against symptomatic disease, but it's as good as the adults. And again, because it's symptomatic disease, the, 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 the assumption, and again, I, for, you know, willing to you know, underscore that, is just like the adult to, you know, only works 44% uh, against Omicron. We know that the adult vaccine is still holds even at four or five, six months, it's somewhere between about 80% against hospitalizations. So while the, the pediatric vaccines of 40% you know, vaccine efficacy and symptomatic disease, you would expect that they would give you even greater protection against serious disease. And that's really why we are you know, immunizing. So this will come, these data will come. Let me just show you one other slide, if I may, Dr. Hirsch. This is the reactogenicity. This is the safety profile because everything you got to measure what the efficacy is, right? Did it meet the immunobridging? What's the vaccine efficacy? What's the risk for hospitalization of these kids? That all has to go in, but what's the safety profile? And what you see is that, first of all, there were no deaths. There was no myocarditis. There was no pericarditis. I mean, again, these are always, you know, you always learn more as, you know, over time. But the, the key issue is, is fever 
and you see in the infants the incidence of any fever over 38 degrees was uh, 14%. Um, in young, in the, the older age group was 17%. And it was down to, and these are the things you're most concerned, you look at fevers for greater 40 was 0.2%. Now, some of these kids also, when this study was done, it was, you know, winter months, there was some intercurrent uh, uh, illness. Uh, also, when you look at that fever profile, um, it's not unlike other vaccines. So that's the safety profile. And let me just add one other, give you one other piece. And um, I think I'm answering, you know, the, the, the question of why is this so complex? Pfizer, um, and we have not yet seen, and Pfizer doesn't, I mean, th their data has not been unblinded. Pfizer, I said, had been doing, um, had continued their two-dose vaccine study to a three-dose vaccine study. I would expect by the end of the month, there will be a press release on whether Pfizer's three doses meet the immunobridging uh, requirements, just like Moderna has, but what we will see is what's the vaccine efficacy against symptomatic Omicron. And that's anyone's guess. Is it gonna be the same? Is it gonna be better? So what I predict is Moderna is gonna you know, go forward on June 8th with this data. Pfizer's press release, that data will come out. The Verpac will then consider the Pfizer data in all likelihood um, at the June 21st uh, and June 22nd, it's going to go to ACIP. Um, and let's see how that, I mean, it's all going to be play out in public view. Let me stop there. Um, I've gone on, but you understand the complexity. It's very interesting. And thank you for sharing this hot off the press data. We were probably one of the first uh, people to have a chance to look at this data. Um, do you think that uh, it sounds like maybe Pfizer made a wrong best guess when they chose the dose they chose. Are there any considerations to going back and, re and doing another group of children with, the, with a higher dose for, Fis for Pfizer's vaccine? It's going to take, you know, I mean, what, what we're seeing, I, you know, I think we all recognize that this has gone on for a very significant time. We want to, I mean, my personal view, and I don't want to speak for FDA, is I would love to get some immunogenicity in these kids. I mean, the good news is, you know, we are not seeing you know, a great deal of serious disease, right? Uh, but if I can prevent these kids from being infected, we don't know the effect of long COVID on these kids. I would much rather give them, get some immunity. <clears throat> them. You know, we can then talk about a third dose, you know, uh, ultimately, but the most important thing, let's get to your question. So if I, Moderna chose a dose that was a quarter of the adult dose, Pfizer chose adult, there was a, a, a dose that was a 10th of the adult dose, right? Now, I showed you the fever. What do you guess the fever profile is gonna be of Pfizer? I tell you, in Moderna's fever profile was like 14% in those kids, right? My guess is lower dose, lower reactogenicity. So if you're a parent, let, let's assume for the moment, this, this is gonna get complicated. Right? This is gonna be one of the harder things to message. I mean, it is possible, and ACP, ACIP is gonna debate this. Well, does it, did Moderna meet its immunobridging? Yes. Is it safe? All likelihood, yes, it's acceptable. But so it's gonna come up with a two dose. Pfizer's gonna come up with a three dose. And you go, well, the fever in the two dose is 14% or 17%. Let's see what the fever is in the Pfizer, but it's gonna be less, you know, I mean, it's a, it's a lower dose. So my guess is it's um, going to be less. So which is better, three doses over a longer period of time, or is it better to get these kids two doses? You, you can imagine the debate that's going to occur in that advisory committee. And, you know, what I encourage, the reason I wanted to show this, you know, in, in the data, you know, it, it may change a little before the, the presentations, but, you know, please tune in to, to the, you know, FDA's VRPAC and the ACIP and follow along. But you can see, do you want to do this in two doses? Do you want to do this in three doses? Look, my goal is, I mean, I really do believe these children do deserve to get some immunogenicity. You know, I feel bad it's taken this long, um, but, you know, we finally have the data. Well, no, as you said, I think many of us feel the sooner the better. And uh, some immunity is better than no immunity. 
Uh, I want to shift now to a question about the older age children. So the five to 11 age group. Um, there was actually just a, a report in today's New York Times showing that only 28%, 28.7% of children in that age group have received two doses. Uh, what are your thoughts about this low level of vaccination in, in this group of children? So 28% um, is in uh, two doses, about 35% uh, is in one dose. Um, and look, you know, we, we, it's been an enormous success getting the vaccines. Again, they're not perfect in the, in the drugs, um, but getting people to use them, you know, I mean, for, you know, I mean, I think are complicated. I, and, you know, we've studied, you know, the Kaiser Family Foundation has done studies of, you know, uh, you, you have to recognize that some people, you know, just are the philosophy, I don't want to be first, especially with my kid. I don't want to be first. I want to wait. You know, the good news is, you know, we now have, you know, 580 million in arms. So for adults, people who are waiting, 580 million have been done, you know, with, you know, but there are certainly some that I think are, you know, are waiting. The other question is, you know, what's the perception and what's the reality of how serious this disease is in five uh, to 11 year old kids. Um, and I think that when you look at, I've given you the efficacy um, and the safety, but you gotta do the overall risk benefit. Um, now, I think we certainly have seen tens of millions of kids you know, uh, I mean, it's been, you know, have been infected. I mean, you know, uh, uh, below the age of uh, 18. Hospitalizations, I mean, I mean, are very real. We've seen, you know, uh, some of these kids do end up uh, in the PICU. And uh, I mean, there is that. But, but when you do the overall risk benefit equation, certainly, you know, when there was a risk of myocarditis, then you had to, you know, look at how many cases of myocarditis, how many, you know, cases of COVID, and, and you know, you had to balance those two. I mean, the good news in this age group is I, we're not seeing any serious adverse events. Um, but the fact is, what are we really uh, protecting against, right? Are we protecting against hospitalization? I mean, it's not that great against symptomatic disease. Right. But I will tell you, um, you know, having watched some of the, you know, young kids below five get infected, it's not pretty. They may not end up in the hospital, um, but I'd much prefer them, you know, the, the, the virus not to, you know, uh, attach to the cells, get inside the cells. I'd rather stop it before. But I could understand with not a lot of hospitalizations, I mean, that weighs on pediatricians. I think most of us. I mean, would agree that the risk, and let's hear the ACIP, but I think there's, you know, little doubt that overall, when you look at this, I would expect that the risks are acceptable in light of the benefits. So I expect this to be, um, but I think there's a lot of different reasons. Um, yes. I think, I mean, that go into um, that low number. Again, when you realize that we've gotten to 89% of adults have had at least one dose, this is really, you know, this 28% um, uh, number really sticks out as an aberration. So we have more work to do. Um, and I think we are all very, you know, we want to make sure that nothing we do here also undermines childhood vaccination programs. Mm -hmm. Well, this gets to uh, another question. I'm going to just ask now more broadly, move away a little bit from sp specifically addressing children to the broader question about where we are in the pandemic and uh, where we are with vaccination and boosters. So as you alluded to, the original vaccines were, were made against a uh, uh, the original virus. And of course, now we have all these variants and the Omicron in particular, the, um, the efficacy of the vaccination uh, that's being currently used uh, seems to be reduced compared to the original. So, um, and then there's some data suggesting that the benefits of a uh, second booster are short-lived. 
um, and add that to the perception that the disease maybe has become milder perhaps with Omicron. Um, there's a lot more immunity in the population now. The estimates are that the majority of Americans now have some immunity either because they have been infected or they've been vaccinated or both. So what is your what are your thoughts now in terms of the recommendations now for a second booster? Um, and how do you explain to the public what's the rationale for really trying to get people to to um, to uh, want to go and get that booster shot because uh, that's been um, or the receptivity to that has been declining. Let, let me, uh, Sharice, if you can put up. Let me give you the data that, that we use. I mean, this is you know we're spending a lot of time on this question and also the question of what about a fifth boost in the fall. So this. These are the data that was that were used um, to make the recommendation um, for people over 50. Um, and I'll explain why it was 50 was selected to get a fourth uh, dose. So this is the Israeli data. And if you look at that gray line, you see two doses after four months, right? I mean, we know that, that there was significant waning um, uh, this shows that, um, you know, it was, you, you know, somewhere between 11 and 12 um, uh, rate per 100,000 risk case of severe disease. And <laughs> you can see the real importance of what a third uh, dose does. And this is against severe illness. This is not against uh, a serious illness. And while we do see very significant waning against symptomatic disease, right? The most important thing is that um, the efficacy does hold up uh, against serious disease. And you see the, um, the three dose, the reduction in the number of uh, cases um, from three dose over time with very little waning, but then you see that purple and again, we have more, you know, uh, there's limited data, but based on that, the, the real importance of getting that third dose, I mean, you can, you know, you cut more than half the number of severe cases by that third dose. And certainly, you know, it, we don't have, we have to see how long, you know, the dur whether durability again will be against severe disease, but it seems to be holding, whether it was Omicron or a Delta or it was ancestral, that, I mean, despite the antigenic drift, um, you know, the, the, against serious disease, it holds against, you know, I think this has to do more with the anatomy and the, you know, the uh, immunology of the nasopharynx and upper airway. Um, but you see the, the purple further reduces your risk of severe disease. But the reason we recommended a fourth dose really was a bridge. Right. I mean, and it was a bridge for the elderly. You know, we, we had done a fall campaign um, with, you know, um, and um, of the third dose for you know, literally, I mean, everybody across the board, we had opened it up to. That clearly worked. That got us through Omicron. The reason, you know, I mean, again, we need more data. But right now, if you're boosted and you're uh, under 65, there are no deaths from Omicron that we're aware of um, for people under 65 and who are boosted. I mean, so one of the reasons why I think we handled Omicron so well is yes, I mean, th there's more immunity uh, in the population from more exposure, uh, but getting 89% of adults at least one dose in there, um, I think that's why you know we are changing the course of this disease. But right there is the slide on the fourth dose and the value of the fourth dose. Again, we'll have to see whether it's durable. Now, the question is, why don't we take that down? Dr. Hershey, you know, then the question becomes, what about the fifth dose and what, what's going to happen for the fall? So, <clears throat> I mean, I, I see two really very important questions. I mean, what's occupying my time? We got to get these kids, we got to get vaccines, safe and effective vaccines to kids under five, the, the, the highest priority. We also, I think, Again, I don't want to get out ahead of uh, FDA or ACIP. And there's a June 28th VERPAC meeting. But we do see um, what, you know, if you talk about a combination vaccine. Now, we've only seen it because we had to start it last year. So the combinations we tested 
were, you know, prototype the ancestral plus a beta variant. And that seems to give us, you wonder why beta, but again, it gives you the broader coverage. Um, that seems to give um, improved durability from everything I have seen. Now we expect over the next number of weeks, you know, we are getting in data about with a combination of prototype, the ancestral vaccine combined with an Omicron specific variant. And I would hope, I mean, if I were a betting person, I would expect that would, that would be to be as good as, you know, prototype plus beta, maybe even better against Omicron, and again, which Omicron is it BA1, is it BA2, is it BA2.12.1? So I would expect that, you know, we are moving in the direction. Um, and if I were a betting person, I would think what we would be offering would be a bivalent um, a variant specific vaccine uh, in the fall. And the reason for the fourth dose was because of the number of cases, the very significant number of cases that we're seeing now. You know, I mean, you know, there just is a great deal of circulating uh, Omicron is we wanted to give people over 50 uh, coverage because we were seeing waning. Um, you know, originally we were thinking about doing it over 65, but for equity reasons, I'm happy to discuss, we took it down to 50. Yeah. Um, As a bridge to try to get until the new vaccine would be available. That has, That raises another question that's been on my mind, which is, when this revolutionary RNA vaccine technology came out and it was, it was miraculous how quickly we could develop a vaccine and get it into people's arms. Um, there was a lot of discussion at that point about that it's gonna be possible within weeks to generate new vaccines against variants. You know, six to eight weeks, you come out with another, another vaccine. And yet, we haven't seen that yet. Uh, it, it sounds like from what you're describing that there's there are efforts in place to, that that will be coming, but why is it taking as long? It, it seemed like um, what we were hearing was that it would be a lot quicker to be able to develop variant specific vaccines than what we've seen. And what's the reason for that? You wanna get the clinical, you wanna get the data, certainly the immunobridgeting data, <laughs> you have to get, um, uh, and you have to test even that I mean, so you have to collect that clinical trial data. The actual making it can be done, you know, I mean, I think, I think it's really a hundred. I mean, if I, if I give the go ahead today, I can get the variant. If we give the go ahead today, I need to give the companies about a hundred days and they can produce the vaccine and I can have a vaccine, but that doesn't, I got to have the clinical data to support that. Now, the reason why the, um, the, um, we, so, I mean, FDA uh, stuck with the prototype vaccine was it continued to see high vaccine efficacy against hospitalization and death with the prototype. So why change if you're still in the 80% plus range? So as long as that was holding, right, um, the, the FDA decided to go with what, you know, uh, it knew. I mean, obviously, whenever you make a bivalent, you're putting two vaccines you know, I mean, in essence, I mean, it had, you know, there are complexities in the manufacturing uh, process. You're, there's a change in process. So you have to be very respectful. You d don't make changes just, you know, on a whim. And we were seeing very high retained vaccine efficacy. So that's why we stuck with it. But I think as we move out, <coughs> again, the, the numbers are remarkable against preventing hospitalization. I mean, this has become primarily Right. I mean, I and I underlord primarily. Uh, we'll see if it holds. This is primarily now an outpatient disease. Mm -hmm. uh, but you do feel that uh, it's likely that we'll we will see a uh, a new vaccine in the fall that, with it that has that's specific against some of the variants. That that's that's coming next. Yes, I believe. That, I mean, that that you will certainly see that data uh, over the next number of weeks. Um, and that will be presented in public view first on uh, June 28th uh, to the FDA uh, VERPAC meeting. I want to ask a couple of questions about uh, uh, the pandemic and health equity. Uh, as, as we all know, the pandemic has disproportionately impacted communities of color and communities of lower socioeconomic status in this country. 
Could you share a little bit about what's being done at the federal, the state, and the local levels to address this? If you look initially, just from the vaccine, from you know my little vantage point, um, I think initially we saw a gap uh, and a divergence between, um, if you looked at different groups, um, what the uptake was, and I think that that gap has closed, and that didn't just close because of, um, you know, I mean, that took a lot of work and a lot of effort, many local uh, groups, local leaders, um, to help. Again, I think the real issue is confidence. Um, you know, I mean, a lot of things that go into people's decision to take a, a dose. But our goal was, um, no matter where you are in this country, rural or urban was to provide a vaccine uh, that was free and accessible and easy to get. Um, and that, that was our goal. Um, you know, there was a story today um, that, that's criticizing us because uh, there may be some wastage, but if you show up and um, in a rural town or in an urban center, no matter, a city, no matter where you are today, and you're the only one that shows up today um, we'll open a vial, even though these are multi-dose vials, there's no preservatives, you get your vaccine. And we made a decision, we'll throw out the rest because it's only good for a day, uh, because we really wanted to uh, be committed uh, to making sure that there's broad access. Um, I don't see a, a significant gap uh, uh, among um, uh, different groups. Um, I think we've closed that, but that, again, there was a lot of hard work. The most important thing for me personally, um, and I know you know the, the president feels this way, but we'll have to see, is understand this has all been free. Right? And that's just been a very key principle from the beginning um, to make sure that, look, there are a lot, of, a lot of hurdles we understand, right? There's a lot of misinformation, right? Um, there's, um, there's a lot of mistrust. But our goal was to get, you know, these, you know, we put uh, 733, delivered 733 million doses because we wanted to make sure this was widely available, free, and at least we would um, remove as many barriers as we could. Mm -hmm. um, one of the reasons we took the boost down to 50 was um, if you look at, you know, over 65, I mean, there, there are certainly, uh, 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 people of color um, with comorbidities um, that are, have everything as great a risk, I mean, from 50 to 65. So if you do 65, I think that creates certain disparities. And that's why we uh, made sure that, um, uh, that uh, we, we wanted to make sure that there were no disparities. And that's why we took the, that age cut off down. Okay, I want to ask one more question, and then I'm going to um, I'm going to I want to have a little time for questions from the audience. There's a bunch of questions coming up, so here's my last question. Um, I just saw a Gallup poll showing that only one third of Americans are either somewhat or very worried about getting COVID, and it seems like now you know you you, you travel around, masks are coming off on the planes, you don't see masks anymore. There's this strong sort of desire by many, many people to get back to life. And um, Tony Fauci recently suggested maybe we're out of the pandemic phase. Um, what's your personal thoughts about getting back to living normally versus continuing to be vigilant? You mentioned that this is now primarily an outpatient disease. People primarily, I just want to be careful. Primarily, you know, primarily there's, yes. There's still very sick hospitalizations um, uh, last night you know, we're up some 17 uh, percent uh, week over uh, week. I mean, there's, yeah. you know, so there's certainly, I mean, I just, I'm just talking about primarily. Yes, no, point well taken. Uh, but, um, uh, you know, as you know, there people want to get back to living and back to normal and they're sick and tired of the pandemic. And at the same time, as you just pointed out, there's still risk, there's still uh, danger, people are still dying. What's your personal view or recommendation about how should we be living our lives now in this in this with this ongoing 
disease that this virus that continues to be in our communities. There's a significant amount of COVID that is circulating. Um, I think we are on the ascendancy. There's no question we are on the ascendancy of a curve. The question is just how, how, how high that curve will go. Um, that curve will, some of my colleagues, you know, talking today um, has suggested, well, this is just going to be the um, spring bump, right? Um, others say, you know, well, you know, we may match the January curve. We may be on, is, I mean, uh, you know, how high is this kind of, and none of us know that. Um, the good news is if you're vaccinated and boosted, right? Um, you know, you're not going to get serious illness. Now, there's still, I mean, this this virus is still a lot of different forms, right? Um, and it's full consequences. This is not a picnic. Getting, I mean, some people it's very mild, but even as an outpatient disease, um, uh, th there's still serious consequences, and we have more to learn about um, long COVID you know, however we define that exactly. My hope, I mean, so I think we're gonna be in this Omicron um, world for, I mean, leave aside what can hit us next, right? What the next, you know, major variant, but, you know, I see we're in the midst of 12. You know, 2 12 one. I see South Africa is, you know, I'm, every weekend we're talking to our colleagues there, four and BA four and five are on the rise there. I don't know whether that's going to come here because they went from BA two to BA 4.5. They didn't have 2.12.1 is, you know, so we don't know whether what will outcompete. But there's, a, you know, you talk to the great evolutionary virologist, Trevor Bedford's, there is a lot of room where this, vac this virus can continue to mutate. There's no, there is no room. So I think we're going to be, we're going to have considerable amount of circulating disease, right? But, and there is still the equivalent of a jetliner crashing every day with 300 deaths. I mean, even though we, we seem, and until we break that, I mean, we, we will not break this, this, um, this virus until we reduce those deaths and those hospitalizations. But I do believe, I mean, if you think about it, vaccine and boost, you know, against serious hospitalization, as my friend, you know, colleague Rob Caleb says, it has a 90% efficacy. You add to that 90% efficacy of Paxlovid. So, you know, the serial, I mean, 90% to 90%, you know, I mean, we're getting up there. I mean, my greatest, I think we can learn to live with this, but we got to get, I mean, I would like to get several other antivirals out there. You know, I think that if I can, if we can put on every corner a safe and effective antiviral, you know, Paxlovid is remarkable at the level of efficacy. I mean, it's it's a little clunky. It's 30 pills. There's a lot of drug-drug interactions. Docs are, we got to get docs more comfortable with prescribing. We don't have the data in kids. You know, that's going to be, you know, that's going to take a while. But if you know that you're not going to get, you know, you can take a, you know, an antiviral um, and that's going to, you know, if you're vaccine and boosted and I can give you an antiviral, that'll change the perception of risk. And that's my goal. If I can get that on every corner and get docs to freely, freely prescribe and um, we, we, this virus, my, my hunch is going to continue to circulate. But I do believe, you know, through just the enormous of eff eff efforts of, you know, just everybody, I think we have the tools, um, how we approach it. Great. Well, let me take one or two questions from the audience. So one question related to, to uh, uh, oral antivirals, are there, uh, in addition to Paxlovid, are there more uh, coming down uh, the pike that you anticipate will be um, available shortly? Yes. I mean, the, the, the answer is there are data. Again, no one knows whether you're going to hit. I mean, they are, you know, I have phase 2A, phase 2B study. But I will tell you, I mean, my greatest concern right now, my biggest problem is I don't have um, the commitment from the Congress to be able to support that. I mean, in order, I mean, I, we can bring that, but we have to bring the manufacturing of that to the United States to have those doses produced. We have to take the risk uh, of developing those and there's no sure bets. Um, and, uh, you know, if Congress, you know, gave us the money, I'm pretty confident, again, 
we'd have a pretty good chance of developing another antiviral uh, by the end of this year. But without those resources, when you know, we may be able to get some of the clinicals up, but we're not going to. You don't turn around and have either hundreds of millions. I mean, the, the effort that it took to get to where we are. I mean, my greatest concern is we're not going to continue to maintain the level of investment. Is any of the forty billion dollars that uh, uh, that's up at Congress being would be allocated for this? Yes. Okay, another question from the audience. Uh, for children older than five, um, in the five to 17 year old uh, range, assuming the Moderna uh, uh, vaccine is approved, between the Moderna and Pfizer vaccine, are there any differences between them in terms of prefer preferable yeah. one versus the other? And is there any data about mixing and matching for boosters for those for those kids? So great, great stuff. We, we are doing mix, mixing and matching and we're funding that uh, and our NIH colleagues are doing that in adults. Understand one thing, um, there will not be labeled product. I mean, Moderna is coming forward with an EUA in kids from six to 11. Right, and that's going to be um, looked at again in these June meetings. Uh, right now, we have Pfizer product out there and available. Um, we have prioritized. Um, we have prioritized getting doses from uh, for kids under five ready and label for those kids. And if you don't, if it's labeled as a boost, yes, you can use those drugs, but then you get medication errors and whatever. So we're not going to have even if Moderna hits at six to 11, we prioritize the doses for the, you know, the six month to five to have those. So you, for a while, you're still only going to have Pfizer doses likely labeled. Now we may be able to work out a, a way to the Moderna doses also will be labeled, but my view is let's, you know, the, the real gap is getting under five. We already have the five to 11s covered, but so it'll be a little while before we get both of them in approved labels, but maybe there's something we can do in FDA will work on that. Let's see, in the next couple of weeks. I mean, I don't know, um, uh, again, uh, everything, one of the great things that my colleague, the, the, the HHS has set up is the adverse event monitoring, right? I mean, uh, and on the vaccine side, I've never seen, you know, being a sort of a pharmacoepidemiologist and grown up in the world of adverse reactions, we keep very close a tab on that, and I don't. I'm not aware of any difference. Um, that uh, I mean, I, I'm not aware of any signals in the Pfizer, and I see nothing in the clinical trials of Moderna that would give me any pause that anything would be greatly different. You are going to have this difference. You are going to have this fundamental difference next week, but under five, you're going to have basically you have a three dose combination versus a two dose combination, and we got to sort that out. Um, and that's going to be complicated. Okay, one last question, then I do want to give you um, a minute or two to uh, sum up and share any final thoughts you have. But the last question related to Paxlovid. Um, right now, uh, the indications that have been recommended for Paxlovid are somewhat um, restricted in terms of who should get it. Do you, do you feel that anybody who's who is symptomatic with COVID should get Paxlovid or should it be limited to a certain higher risk individual? So um, right now you are correct that the studies, the studies were done in higher risk individuals because that, you know, high risk individuals, greater, you know, chance of them being hospitalized. And the end point was hospitalization. So the studies were done um, uh, in higher risk individuals. I polled my colleagues internally, you know, you know all their names um, because you know, we're getting asked that question on who do you prescribe Paxlovid for, even as pediatricians were getting asked that question about you know, uh, adults. Um, it's a clinical judgment call, right? Um, I think that taking, depends what drugs people are on, um, but if, you know, if there's a reason why you think somebody's at risk, or, or you need to shut off that replication earlier. Um, recognizing is probably only static and recognizing this rebound is probably real, right? Um, I think it's a question of clinical judgment uh, of where uh, you use it. I, I think there's, um, 
every the data just came out. I mean, they, they, there's data coming out again. Generally, it, it's still preliminary. The, the real world evidence that shows its efficacy is main, maintained. Got to do a better job of really understanding what the frequency of this rebound is. Um, my sense is that it tends to be, um, it's not of any great clinical consequence. It may have some consequences for whether you're infectious again. I don't think it's surprising that it's uh, that occurs, but the exact frequency, I think we have to do a better job of understanding. We do see this rebound in both the, um, the placebo group and in the treatment group in the clinical trials. Um, but again, I think if there is rebound, it tends to be mild. But to your, uh, your question, I think docs have to use their clinical judgment in the absence of data. Um, well, great. Uh, we are out of time, but I do want to give you an opportunity, Dr. Kessler, just take a minute or two to share with us any final thoughts you have. You know, I appreciate uh, the opportunity. Um, you know, we've put out, for example, a number of therapeutics uh, in, in December. Uh, we put out, you know, the, you know, the, the newer monoclonals, Evusheld for immunocompromised uh, individuals. These are in adults, uh, as well as Paxlovid. Um, the really remarkable efficacy. Again, these drugs, none of these are perfect by any means, but we really need um, primary care doctors, family docs, uh, uh, anyone taking care uh, of, of adults uh, to feel comfortable uh, with this. You know, uh, just because you put out a medicine doesn't mean you know, docs feel comfortable. Uh, with it, so there's a lot of education, um, and and there's a you know, and I think we still have a big job to do, uh, and need help from the physician community. I see the reason, and I really appreciate Dr. Hirsch spending time on this issue of kids under five, because I think pediatricians are going to play a very great role. I mean, I mean, and let's see if Moderna gets authorized, if Pfizer gets authorized, who's going to have many questions that parents are going to have. Um, and we're going to need help answering those questions. Um, so just very much appreciate the opportunity. Well, great. Thank you, Dr. Kessler. We're so appreciative that you uh, took the time to visit with all of us today. As I mentioned in the beginning, you are a member of our department here of pediatrics at UCSF. And so we're glad to be able to spend some time with you and want to welcome you back here anytime you're available to come up come back and give us an update. Uh, and we hope you'll, you'll reach out to me so we can, we can arrange that. Uh, thanks again. And I wanna thank everybody for participating today. Thank you, sir.